Okay, thank you all for joining me today for this online lecture. And thank you also to the Gildenhorn Institute for Bone and Joint Health for supporting the entire lecture series. I also wanted to take the opportunity to publicly thank Kathy Pulford for helping to organize the entire orthopedic academic program at Sibley, including technical support for all of these lectures. The format for this talk will be a talk on navigation, robotics, and some emerging technologies, including augmented reality in spine surgery. And I'll take a few questions at the end. We will be using the question and answer function rather than the chat function on Zoom. So please utilize that question and answer tab to submit any questions you have. So I wanted to start off just introducing myself. So I am Eve Hoffman. I'm gonna go through just a quick introduction with a series of pictures. So I grew up here in Washington, DC. I went to Georgetown Day School for um, the entire uh, 13 years from kindergarten through high school. The lower and middle school was originally located just down the street from Sibley Hospital. Here's a picture of me with my high school cross country team. And then after high school, I went to Brown University and stayed at Brown for medical school. Following graduation from medical school, I did my orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Maryland and Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. This is a picture of my graduating residency class on the helipad of shock trauma on our last day in residency. And then following residency, I did an additional year of training in spine surgery at the Rothman Institute at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. Here's a picture of me in the operating room with a few of my mentors and then with my co-fellows for the year in between some surgeries. And then finally, I joined a great group of surgeons at Summit Orthopedics, where I see patients at our two office locations in Chevy Chase and on New Mexico Avenue near American University. I do the majority of my surgery at Sibley Hospital. So here's an outline of what we will be discussing this evening. To start off, I'll explain the basics of what the goals of spine surgery are so that we all have a good understanding of why image guidance, navigation, and, and other new technologies may be beneficial. Then I'll take some time to go through the evaluation of image guidance in the field of spine surgery, starting with two-dimensional guidance and then moving forward in discussing three-dimensional navigation, robotics, and other emerging technologies such as augmented reality. So to start off with what is spine surgery? The majority of spine surgery focuses on two main goals. The first goal is to create space for either nerves or the spinal cord, which have become pinched, resulting in symptoms such as sciatica, numbness, tingling, pain that shoots down your arms and your legs, or weakness in the arms or the legs. This can be accomplished in many different ways, but generally the surgery or this part of the surgery is referred to as a decompression. And the most common form of a decompression is removing part of the bone from the back of the spine in what's known as a laminectomy. The second goal, which may be necessary in a certain subset of patients, is to provide stability to the spine through fusion of two or more of the vertebral bodies of the spine. And so I operate on the entire spine. I've included um, a diagram here of the spine. So I operate on the neck, which is called the cervical spine, the mid back or the thoracic spine, as well as the low back or the lumbar spine. For simplicity today for this lecture, we are only going to be focusing on the lumbar spine or the low back. So let's take a look at each of those goals separately. Here I've included some cross-sectional imaging of an MRI of the lumbar spine. So to the left of the screen is a normal spine with no evidence of nerve pinching or stenosis. And I'll point out some anatomy here. So I'm circling with my pointer here. The big black circle is the disc space. And directly behind the disc space is another oval. This is the spinal canal. And if we look, this is a normal shape and size for the spinal canal nice and big and oval, we can see lots of little small gray dots, which are the nerve roots, and they're surrounded by a lot of bright white fluid. 
And so then this middle picture is what I would refer to as moderate stenosis. Rather than that nice big oval, we see that the spinal canal is now more triangular and those small nerves or those little gray dots are being pushed together a little bit further. And then finally, all the way to the right is what I would refer to as severe stenosis. Here, we don't see those individual nerve roots. They're being pushed together so severely, and we also don't see any of that protective spinal fluid. So the part of the surgery to open up this space um, and to make those that, that middle image and that right-sided image look, look more like the left-side image is a very delicate part of the procedure. I'm operating right decks to the nerves as well as the covering to the spinal canal. Uh, so this part of the surgery is never performed by a robot. This would be performed by a well-trained human instead. So in a subset of patients with spinal issues, the root cause of those symptoms is actually abnormal motion of the spine or what we refer to as instability. In these patients, just performing a decompression alone won't address that abnormal motion. So these are the subset of patients with whom I discussed the need for having a fusion surgery. And so I've included as an example, two side view x-rays here. On the left is an x-ray of a normal lumbar spine. So here we see the sacrum or the very bottom bone, which comes down to the tailbone. And then we see the blocks of bones or vertebral bodies, which are stacked on top of each other. In between the vertebral bodies are the disc spaces, which don't show up on an x-ray, but we can see where the discs are and we can compare the heights of all these discs and say these all look normal in terms of their height. The next thing I look at is the overall alignment of the spine. And so there's a nice sort of curved C shape to the lumbar spine, which again is normal. And then the last thing I look at is I wanna trace the backs of the bones to make sure that they all line up well with each other. And so as an example, on the right, we see at one level right here that I'm circling that there's a bone that shifted forward in relation to the bone directly below it. So we sort of lose that nice um, solid line in the back of the bones. And so that abnormal motion can lead to both back pain and also can contribute to there being less space for the nerves in that area. And so the primary means of fixing that abnormal motion is through a lumbar fusion where screws are placed along the top and bottom bone levels where that shift has occurred. These screws are then connected with a rod that prevent the abnormal motion. So the screws that are used are referred to as pedicle screws because the corridor of bone that the screw traverses is known as the pedicle. Pedicle screws were invented in the 1960s and we still use those today as the primary method for fusing the lumbar spine. So here I've included a diagram as well as an x-ray showing what a lumbar fusion looks like. The rest of this lecture is going to focus specifically on different methods for inserting screws into that pedicle. The traditional insertion method for pedicle screws involves using known anatomic landmarks to find the correct start point and trajectory to ensure the screw is properly inserted along the path of the pedicle. So this is a cross-sectional diagram which shows the head of the screw outside of bone and then the screw traversing this bony area, again, which is known as the pedicle, and then the tip of the screw ends within the vertebral body or this large part of the bone up front here. So in order to place this screw using the traditional method, I use a small bone drill to create a pilot hole as a start point and then advance a probe along the length of the pedicle until it's within the vertebral body. After the probe has entered along the path, I remove it and then insert a smaller device to feel along the path and ensure that there is bone on all sides of the tract. And then once that's been confirmed, I place a screw along the same path. So although the traditional method is very accurate for inserting a screw in the correct location, there's always the potential for misplacement of pedicle screws. So this diagram here shows an example of a well-placed pedicle screw in the top left. So again, just as the previous slide showed, 
the head of the screw is outside of bone. And then we see the screw traversing through that bony corridor known as the pedicle. And then the tip of the screw ends within the vertebral body. And so the rest of these images show examples of potentially misplaced screws. So this image shows a pedicle screw, which is placed a little bit too medial. And so we can see some of the threads of the screw are actually within the spinal canal. And that can cause irritation or injury to the nerves within the spinal canal. Here we have an example of a similar thing, but the entirety of the screw is within the spinal canal. So this screw is placed far too medial. And then on this next line here, we have an example of a screw that is slightly too lateral. Um, and so we see a few of the threads are outside of the pedicle. This screw is entirely lateral to pedicle. So this was an okay start point, but the trajectory of the screw was too lateral. So it missed the pedicle here. And then the entirety of the screw is lateral to the vertebral body. Here's an example of a screw that was placed in a proper position, but was slightly too big. So we see that the tip of the screw is actually too far forward and outside of the vertebral body. And then here's some examples of a side view. So here's a well-placed screw on a side view. So we see again, this area here is the pedicle and we see the, the screw traversing the pedicle and ending within the vertebral body here. Here's an example of a screw that's placed a little bit too low. And so that's important because there's a small hole that you can see here and another one right here. Those are the holes from which the nerves exit. And so this screw again may be irritating that nerve that is coming out of that hole. And then finally, here's an example of a screw that had a good start point, but the trajectory was a little bit too high. And so the tip of the screw is actually ending within the disc space above. So with new advances in intraoperative imaging, we have been able to improve upon that traditional method for placing pedicle screws. This timeline shows how historical advances in medical imaging was happening simultaneously with advances in computers, as well as surgical and spinal robots, which is really in its infancy today. So just to go over some relevant history, and this is starting on the left-hand side of this uh, timeline here, we can see that X-ray technology was discovered in the late 19th century. So back then, Tesla was not yet a fancy car. He was an inventor who, along with Wilhelm Rentgen, was responsible for the early X-ray technology. And then it wasn't until 1955 that X-ray had advanced to the point where a machine was small and mobile enough to be useful in the operating room. And then by 1972, we had the ability to obtain three-dimensional imaging using a CAT scanner. But again, it wasn't until 2005 that a CAT scanner was able to be brought into the operating room. And then much more recently, all the way to the right-hand side of our timeline, three major spine robots entered the market between 2016 and 2018. And we'll go into a little more depth um, in terms of the, what those are and how those work towards the end of this lecture. So the first navigation technology we'll discuss is two-dimensional navigation, which involves using a portable digital x-ray machine to obtain imaging of the pedicle both in the front view and the side view. The portable x-ray machine is called a C-arm and that's what's depicted here, the machine on the slide. Um, and again, we saw on our imaging timeline, this was first invented and brought into the operating room in the mid 1950s. So two-dimensional imaging can be used with traditional surgical techniques along with that traditional method of using direct visualization of the anatomy, or it can be used instead of traditional surgical approaches in certain situations to allow smaller incisions. So in the minimally invasive technique, a sharp cannulated probe is advanced along the length of the pedicle and a guide wire is placed within the probe. And then finally, a cannulated pedicle screw can be inserted along the length of the guide wire. So here we see two intraoperative images, which we can obtain using the C-arm. This is looking at the spine from the front and at every level of the lumbar spine, we see two circles. And those circles represent looking at the pedicle straight on from the front down the corridor. And then we see a lateral view. And again, we see the pedicle here and the vertebral body. So intraoperatively, if we're going to be making small incisions like are depicted here, 
We use x-ray to place our probe within the pedicle and follow along to make sure as it's advancing through the pedicle, it never gets to the most medial border of this circle until it's well within the vertebral body. And then again, I place a guide wire through that probe and you can see the guide wires here. And then finally, the last step is to place screws over those guide wires. And you can see there's two sort of tubes here at the very end of those tubes are screws that are placed perfectly within the pedicle. As I mentioned, three-dimensional imaging's main advancement over traditional technique is that in many cases, it may allow for placement of screws through, the, through those smaller incisions. Although again, if a patient requires a decompression procedure simultaneously, a smaller incision may not be possible for that surgery. There are also several limitations to this technique. So the primary limitation is that multiple x-ray images are needed to visualize in both the front view and that side view. So this necessitates moving the C-arm machine throughout the procedure and taking multiple images, which results in increased radiation dose to the patient, the operating room staff, and the surgeons. Second, again, as I, I showed you, most frequently a guide wire is used in this technique and has the potential to move or to break as a screw is advanced over this wire. This can cause damage to nerves or other nearby structures if you're not closely paying attention and getting multiple x-ray images as you advance the screw. And then finally, this technique may be impossible due to difficulty obtaining those perfect x-ray views. This may be the case if a patient is large or if the pedicles are unusually small. So now moving on to three-dimensional technology. Three-dimensional imaging in the operating room first became possible with the invention of a small portable CAT scanner called the O-arm. And this is a picture of that machine here. A CAT scan creates a cross-sectional image of the spine and allows surgeons to look at bones in multiple different orientations simultaneously. So the O-arm allowed for 3D scanning of the patient in the exact position of surgery. Prior to the O-arm's invention, patients could get a CAT scan before surgery, but there were small changes to the position of the spine when placed in the position of surgery, which made navigation using the three-dimensional imaging less accurate. So the O-arm inventing in 2005 removed the inaccuracy and improved upon the prior navigation technology. So in order to use the three-dimensional images for the purposes of navigation, the first step is to perform what's called registration. And so registration occurs by matching the medical imaging coordinate system to the coordinate system of a tracker, such as a camera. And once registration is complete, you can then relate any point in space seen by the camera to the corresponding location on the three-dimensional three images. And so this allows us to track instruments and screws on the patient's image in real time. So the process of this registration starts by rigidly placing a reference array into the patient using a clamp or a spike that's placed solidly into bone during surgery. The reference array has a cluster of tracking markers, which the camera can follow. And the surgery is then performed using, again, real-time tracking of each particular surgical tool. This allows for simultaneous tracking of instruments and screws in multiple planes without taking multiple x-rays or without moving the machine. And so again, here's what the O-arm looks like. Um, and here's the display screen. Here's an example of what the camera looks like. And so here's the reference array which gets solidly um, either placed, this is a clamp, but there's a clamp option or another option for a spike that gets placed into bone during the surgery and prior to obtaining the CAT scan with the O-arm. This is what it looks like for the patient going through the O-arm. And you can see sterile draping surrounding the patient as they're going through the O-arm and obtaining that intraoperative CAT scan. And then here on the right-hand side is the reference array pin, which in this case is solidly placed into part of the pelvic bone so that it doesn't move during the surgery. This is what appears on the display. So again, the surgeon's able to track the instrument in multiple planes of view and even customize the orientation of the images to allow for insertion of the screw without moving the machine or taking additional images. 
So the main advantage of navigation is that it has the potential to be more accurate than two-dimensional imaging, since again, you're able to track the screws and instruments in multiple planes of view. In addition, there's significantly decreased radiation dose to the surgeon and the staff because the CAT scan with the O-arm is performed while the staff and the surgeon step away from the field behind a protected wall, compared to what happens during two-dimensional imaging, which occurs with the surgeon next to the patient, but wearing a leaded apron. And then finally, this technology has the potential to shorten operating room time by decreasing the need to take multiple individual x-rays. Although like all new technology, there's definitely a learning curve and some troubleshooting involved when things don't go perfectly with the O-arm or the reference array is moved during surgery. And I'll mention a few times throughout this lecture in terms of how quickly things happen or how long it takes. And, you know, I think in terms of patients thinking about whether or not that's relevant, certainly less time under anesthesia is, is safer in general. So shorter operating room times are better for patients and for surgeons. And then disadvantages of the three-dimensional navigation includes increased radiation exposure to the patient. On our next slide, I'll show a study of the difference in radiation doses to the patient between the two technologies we just discussed. And then second, the reference array, which is used for registration, again, is usually attached to the patient's body. If it's moved at all during surgery, it can make the navigation less accurate and potentially useless or it may require a redo of the intraoperative CAT scan. And then finally, the O-arm and navigation system are certainly more expensive than a typical C-arm or digital X-ray machine. So I care a lot about radiation dose, both the dose to my patients, but also the additive dose of radiation that I'm exposed to over my career. Um, I also really don't like wearing a lead apron while I operate, so I'm always looking for technology that lets me place pedicle screws accurately, avoid radiation, and also remain as comfortable as possible while I operate. So this was a study that was done in 2017 that looked specifically at children with scoliosis who underwent fusion and compared the radiation dose with conventional C-arm or two-dimensional imaging to the dose from the O-arm, which is the three-dimensional imaging. And the study found that on average, the radiation dose from the O-arm was four times higher than the, do the dose from the C-arm. But the C-arm or two-dimensional imaging dose can vary widely depending on the number of images that were taken during the surgery, the weight of the patient, and the specific settings of the machine that were used. So this is definitely important to consider when thinking about what technology to use for each surgery. So our next topic will be robotics in spine surgery. And I was lucky enough to do some of the first robotic spine surgery cases in the country with one of my mentors in Philadelphia. This is a picture of me using the Globus Excelsius robot for a spinal fusion case in 2018, which was the first year that this was FDA approved for use. And then because I'm so photogenic, um, the picture here from that same surgery ended up as the cover for the first ever textbook about navigation and robotics in spine surgery. So that's my big claim to fame. So as we start off um, talking about robotics, we wanna know what does robotics mean? And in general, when we're talking about robotics used in any kind of surgery, there are really three different types of robots. So the first one is called a supervisory controlled system. In that system, the machine is programmed with predetermined actions that are carried out with the robotic um, arm operating with predetermined actions that the robotic arm is using um, with autonomy and close surgeon supervision. And this is rarely used today really in any type of surgery. The second type of robotic system is called telesurgical systems. In these systems, the surgeon has complete control over the motions of the machine from a remote command station. And this type of robot is actually used frequently in other types of surgery, including urology and gynecology. And here on, a left, on the left-hand side is a picture of what telesurgical systems looks like using the most commonly available robot, which is called the Da Vinci. And you can see here, one surgeon is at the command center while an assistant is scrubbed into the surgery, helping to change out instruments on the robotic arm. And then the final type uh, is called shared control. 
This is a form of co-autonomy, which allows both the surgeon and the robot to simultaneously control motions. And this is the type of robot that's currently being used in spine surgery and what is depicted on the right-hand side of the image. So going forward in this lecture, I will be mentioning a few brand names of different products. I just wanna make note that I have no financial interest in any of these companies and I'm not giving out any stock tips today. I'll save those for a future lecture. So there are currently three available robots on the market for spine surgery. On the left-hand side, we see the Mazor X, um, which got FDA approval in December of 2018. The Rosa robot in the middle gained FDA approval initially in 2016, and then they made a newer generation, which was approved in March of 2019. And then finally, the Globus Excelsius, which is the machine I was trained on, had FDA approval in August of 2017. So all three available robots are similar in concept. So they combine the three-dimensional navigation we just discussed with a robotic arm, which helps to target a pre-planned start point and trajectory for the pedicle screws. The Mazor robot has an arm which attaches to the bed, whereas the robot and the Excelsius are freestanding machines with sensors attached to the patient for registration purposes. So just like in 3D navigation, the first step in robotic spine surgery is registering the patient in space and matching this with the imaging system. There are three different options for imaging while using the robot. So the first option is that the patient can obtain a preoperative CAT scan, which can be done at any point prior to surgery. The CAT scan is then loaded into the robotic system. And this workflow does require additional intraoperative two-dimensional x-rays to register the patient and then merge the x-rays to the CT scan. This is the only option that allows for preoperative screw planning. The other two options are to obtain imaging either via CAT scan or conventional two-dimensional x-rays in the operating room once a reference array has been placed. After successful registration, the next step is planning the screws. The images that have been taken as well as a sterile computer screen are used to plan the location and the trajectory of each screw that's going to be placed during the surgery. And then this is the time that a surgeon can pick the size of the screws as well. And if a surgeon uses a preoperative CAT scan, you do have the ability to plan these screws ahead of time, which can save significant time during the surgery. It also saves issues with making sure that you have, you have the right number of screw sizes that you need during surgery. After the screws have been planned, the robot is brought into place alongside the operating room table. The screen is brought to the head of the bed near the anesthesiologist, and then a screw is selected on the screen and a pedal is pressed by the surgeon to bring the arm into motion to align the tube with the planned trajectory of the screw. An instrument can then be placed through the tube and will appear on the screen. So usually a drill is used first to create a pilot tract and then this is followed by screw placement. So I have a few videos here of this process. Um, they're very short. I'm not sure how well they're gonna work here but we'll do our best um, to play these videos. So here is I think it's going to be a bit choppy here, but we can see the robotic arm sort of falling into place based on where we had pre-planned um, the screw to go. So again, you can see the robotic arm down here is really just a very small metal tube that we can place instruments through. Again, you can see the screen back here that we had used to pre-plan screws. This middle x-ray, you can see I'm holding a drill that's going through that cannula. And then this final image, um, I have a screwdriver with a screw already in place. And I'm just doing basically the final few turns of the screwdriver while I watch on the screen to make sure that that screw matches up with my pre-planned um, location. So let's see if this will work here. So you can just see I'm, I'm watching the screen while turning that screwdriver and making sure that that ends up in the exact location that we want it to be. So um, next, I just wanted to mention basically the biggest complication 
um, which can occur both with three-dimensional navigation and with robotics. And that is that you lose integrity of the registration. So when this happens, the robot and the imaging make it appear as if your instrument is located in a different place than it truly is. So this is a concern because placing a screw just a few millimeters in the wrong direction has the potential to cause nerve injury, which I showed earlier in the lecture. The most common way to lose integrity happens when the reference array gets bumped. And this can happen when instruments are being passed back and forth during surgery. This is especially dangerous in minimally invasive surgery where the surgeon may not have the normal anatomic landmarks to double check the location. So there's two ways to ensure the integrity of the registration. The first is by doing an anatomic landmark check. So this is where you place an instrument on a known spot on the spine and check to confirm that the imaging agrees with your instrument location. The second way is to incorporate a second marker, which is called a surveillance marker, which is mounted to another bone location other than the location of the reference array. This surveillance marker will immediately detect if the reference array has shifted or moved and it'll create a display or an alert on the screen. And if integrity is lost at any point during the case, the surgeon needs to either convert to another method or placement or perform a re-registration with new imaging. So the final point I'll make about robotics can be generalized really to any new technology. There will always be a learning curve involved in trying something new. So this was a study um, which investigated a single surgeon who performed 150 surgeries using one of the spine robots over the course of two years. And I would say I had a similar experience to this surgeon during my first 30 or so surgeries, which is that in some instances there was either concern for loss of integrity or some other technical issue. And some or all of the screws were placed in a traditional method rather than using the robot. And then over time, as surgeons become more experienced with the robot, the number of screws converted to manual placement decreases. But what's significant here is that the rate of screws malpositioned by the robot remained low regardless of the experience of the surgeon. So as a summary for robotics, I think this technology is in its infancy, but has some really great potential. The hypothetical advantages are improved surgeon ergonomics, potentially improved precision, and the possibility for decreased radiation to the surgeon, although not necessarily to the patient. And then disadvantages of the robot include the significant extra time it takes to set up, plan, and perform the registration. There may be some amount of time saving once a surgeon has mastered the workflow and feels comfortable with the screw placement. And then as is expected with new medical technology, the robots are all very expensive. So it is a significant investment from the hospital. We did discuss the learning curve involved as well as the problems with loss of integrity requiring re-registration, which also adds additional time as well as radiation to the surgery. And then finally, as someone who is trained to put pedicle screws in without any navigation, it is important to maintain that skill even as these new technologies become more mainstream in the event that the machine isn't working properly or isn't available. And then finally, I'll briefly mention two additional technologies that incorporate navigation and are trying to account for some of the shortfalls of robotics. So we'll discuss 7D uh, surgical navigation system as well as Augmetics augmented reality. So 7D Surgical is a Canadian company, which actually just this week was bought by a much larger spine company. This system uses what's called digital stereoscopic topographical referencing, which is a really fancy way of saying that they use the same technology as self-driving cars. Um, and so that technology that self-driving cars uses to recognize different objects on the road so this is a camera system which takes a picture of the bones of the spine and then uses the picture to surface match with a preoperative CAT scan. And the advantage of this technology is that it allows for much quicker registration and eliminates the intraoperative radiation exposure both to the patient and to, to the staff and the surgeon. So one of the most significant disadvantages of this technology is it can't be used for minimally invasive cases where the bony anatomy is not fully exposed to the camera. 
There's also no robotic arm with this technology. So the workflow once registration has occurred is more similar to three-dimensional navigation than to robotic spine surgery. And I did get to test out um, this system a couple weeks ago in the lab. And I really liked the idea of how quickly the registration occurs. And also, again, the idea that there's no, there's no radiation involved. So you're not having to do an intraoperative CAT scan or an intraoperative X-ray. And then finally, we'll discuss the emergence of augmented reality in spine surgery. So we'll go over a few definitions here for background. So the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality is a situation in which the entire simulation is virtual. This is primarily used for training rather than for any real surgical procedures. Whereas augmented reality is when a computer generated image is superimposed into the real world. And this is similar to what a pilot uses um, with their heads up display with relevant flight safety information projected onto their view in the cockpit. So in spine surgery, the idea is to allow the surgeon to essentially maintain line of sight to the surgical field while still receiving the same 3D navigation feedback. So again, just to go back to virtual reality, again, this is primarily used for residents or surgeons who are in training. This was a study that was performed in China in which 16 trainees were randomly assigned to a virtual reality training system for teaching them placement of pedicle screws. And then um, half of them were taught without virtual reality. And the trainees were then asked to place screws into a cadaver. The study showed that the group which underwent virtual reality training did significantly better than the traditional teaching method. When I was in residency, we did have some amount of virtual reality training available to us, but I have not seen this specific system in action and I'm not sure it's available in the US, although it seems very cool. Um, and then augmented reality on the other hand has the potential to be useful in the operating room. So Augmetics is the name of the one company right now who is doing this. They are an Israeli company and they've created an augmented reality headset, which is customizable to each surgeon and projects navigation imaging, as well as a th uh, three-dimensional reconstructed model of the spine onto a retina display. And I also got to try this out um, fairly recently on a fake spine model. And I think this is interesting, although the current version is a bit bulky. And I found the display actually to be a bit distracting from looking at real patient anatomy. But again, the idea here is that I wouldn't have to turn my head away from the patient to watch a screen with the navigation information on it. So as a conclusion to this talk, before I take any questions, I just wanna summarize my current opinions on navigation and robotics. So the most important thing to note is that all spine surgeons need to be comfortable doing any surgery without the assistance of navigation or ro robotics. We can't become reliant on the technology. We need to be able to recognize when the technology is inaccurate. I also think it's important to consider the situations in which navigation and robotics may be especially helpful. So in my opinion, those are surgeries in which the normal anatomy may be distorted in some way. So specifically that includes revision surgery or surgery with tumors or infections. And then also in some patients who have spinal deformities that may cause the spine to be in an abnormal anatomic location. And then, as I mentioned, there's a learning curve with all new technology, and that's important to consider when adopting or buying into a new system. And then finally, the costs of the technology, as well as the radiation exposure, both to my patients and to me are relevant components of the decision as to what technology to use. So thank you very much for participating tonight. Um, if anyone would like to add questions to the question and answer tab, I'll take a few moments to go through those and pick um, a couple questions. And then um, this last slide here, I've included um, the phone number to my office as well as my website. My website does have information in terms of getting in touch with me via email if you'd like to. And then these are my two office locations as well. And so I'll just go into a little bit more detail as people add questions if they'd like as to 
sort of what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of what imaging systems I'm using. Um, and so for the majority of my surgery, um, if I am not concerned for abnormal anatomy, again, if it's a first time fusion, so not a revision situation, and I'm not having to operate around a tumor or an infection, I'm using just regular um, two-dimensional x-ray to obtain an image in space that shows the orientation of the pedicles. And then I use essentially the traditional technique to make sure that the screws are going through the pedicle into the proper position. If I'm doing a decompression at the same time, I can actually feel the entirety of the pedicle from the inside of the spinal canal, again, to make sure that those are properly positioned. If I am doing a minimally invasive surgery where I think that a decompression isn't necessary, that minimally invasive technique where I use um, x-ray as well as that cannulated probe is a good technique that I'll use in those situations. And then I use three-dimensional navigation really in situations in which I'm having to do a revision surgery. So taking some sort of um, pedicle screw or other hardware out and trying to find good solid bone to put something new back into um, or other situations again, um, which are relatively rare, um, but for more complex cases, that's what I'm doing. All right, let me take a quick peek. So um, a couple, I guess we have a couple questions about that consideration in terms of radiation. And so I think um, it's definitely something that patients should be aware of when they're going into surgery. Um, my goal is that anyone I'm doing a fusion surgery on, that's the only surgery they're going to have on their spine. So the x-rays that are taken in the operating room, um, really, again, it's not going to be so much radiation um, and they're not getting an additive dose over the course of their lifetime. It's really just um, a, a couple x-rays that are happening in the operating room that day. Um, in terms of comparing the radiation dose from X-ray or O-arm, um, what we know about a standard X-ray of the lumbar spine is that is the equivalent of several months of background radiation that you're getting on a day-to-day -day basis. And then a CAT scan of the lumbar spine is equivalent to about a year of exposure, sort of background radiation from day-to-day -day life. Um, and so again, it is very difficult to quantify the risk um, on a single day in the operating room of the radiation involved. And so I would say um, use whatever the surgeon is recommending rather than being so concerned about the, the radiation dose on that particular day. And then a, another question about software computer failure uh, rates for the robot. Um, I have not seen any software failures um, for the robot during surgery. Um, I think at this point they are very, very well tested. And again, that just speaks to the point again that if that failure does happen, the surgeon really needs to be able to do it in the traditional method again. And so for, for the questions, anyone sending a, a specific question about them, um, I'm not gonna answer specific um, concerns related to your own uh, medical history, but I'm happy to do that in the office. And I'll give a few more minutes for anyone to add any additional questions here. And we are just a couple questions here. We are recording um, this presentation and um, so we will have access to um, the entire presentation afterwards for anyone that missed part of it or wants to go back. Any other final questions? I'll leave this open for another few moments. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time today and hopefully you learned something new got to see all the fancy toys that spine surgeons get to play with. All right, I think I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much, have a great rest of your evening.